Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl Stephanie Hardy. If this is your first time listening, welcome and thank you for joining the ride. And if this isn't your first time listening, thank you for continuously supporting me and the show. So of course, in this episode, I've got your news and gossipish and so much has happened within the past two days. And we're going to go into all of that on here. And I've got a special interview with Manny Ma- with Manny Matati and Jason Cosmetas, who are responsible for recording the infamous curtain call incident involving Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Sean Waltman, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash 25 years ago this week. So if you're ready to sink your teeth into this special episode of The Hardy Wrestling Podcast, chill out, get you like a cup of tea or something, but because this is probably one of the best interviews I've ever done. So sit back, relax, and listen to The Hardy Wrestling Podcast. Okay, so in news and gossipish today, there is so much going on even within the past few hours that we're going to discuss. So I just want to go into it right now. Um, Today, we got word actually yesterday into today, we got word of NXT releases. Um, Of course, a few weeks ago, um, close to the day a year ago where WWE released a whole bunch of people due to budget cuts during the first half of the pandemic they released people along the lines of Samoa Joe Mickey James and so many others right so starting yesterday they made some NXT releases as well and some of them are very devastating while others have been kind of yeah everyone was kind of rooting for those to happen so the first person I'm going to talk about is Jessamine Duke, who was part of the Four Horsewomen of the MMA, along with Shayna Baszler, who is a two-time NXT Women's Champion, and I believe at this point a two-time um, NXT, not NXT, a two-time WWE Women's Tag Team Champion alongside Nia Jax. Ronda Rousey, who's a former Raw Women's Champion who hasn't been active, you know, in the past couple of years and is now pregnant with her first child. Congratulations to her. And um, Marina Shafir, who is also married to Roderick Strong. And really, we haven't really seen any of the other two horsewomen on NXT television in such a long time. And it's just kind of weird because one of the things that a lot of the fans were pushing was the fact that they wanted, you know, a four horsewomen battle between Charlotte Flair, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch, and Bayley, you know, to go up against these four horsewomen since they were all in WWE at certain points. But it's looking like they're not going to do that. And they've just let, they've let Jessamine Duke go. I believe the last time we even saw Jessamine, it had to have been on Raw Underground. Y'all, y'all remember that? So yeah, like now she's been cut. Um, Vanessa Bourne has also been released and she used to be a dancer I believe for an NFL team I think it was the the Arizona Cardinals and I remember the first time I saw her it was at the first NXT live show that actually came to Birmingham at the BJCC um, for those who are from Birmingham who knows what that is and I thought she was really pretty you know I thought she was you know really nice on the eyes and she had the potential to grow but then it's just like we hadn't really seen her that much. We maybe saw her maybe twice on television. And then after that, she was just gone. And she would post on Instagram every now and again. But really, we didn't see that much from her in terms of wrestling. And I almost thought that she was going to make a comeback when they had that puppy, you know, running um, on NXT, giving the preview of what turned out to be Frankie Monet, who formerly was um, Valkyrie, I mean, Taya Valkyrie from TNA and Impact. So now she's gone, Vanessa's gone, and Alexander Wolf is gone. And that was really surprising to me because Imperium, you know, he was in Imperium, but then they beat up on him, the other two members um, beat up on him this past week on NXT and then basically wrote him out. So, and basically called him the weak link of Imperium. So now Imperium is just of um, Walter and Marcel Bartel and Fabian Eichner. And it's so sad because Alexander Wolf kind of 
made a little bit of a comeback with Imperium because Sanity basically got dismantled. And really the only people left from what Sanity used to be is Nikki Cross and Killian Dane because the because now Alexander Wolf's gone and Eric Young has been been released from WWE and now he's back in Impact. So now Alexander Wolf is gone. Um so he alluded that on Twitter he there's so much more that he wants to say but then can't really say right now um in terms of his plans for continuing his wrestling career. But we wish all of these people the best. Now we're going to talk about the more notorious releases that happened um, last night into today. Drake Wirtz, I believe is what his name was. He was a referee at NXT for a long while. And his rap sheet was really, really long. And a lot of people on social media were really happy that he got released last night. And this is all along the lines of him sort of being problematic here. Um, one of them was the fact that he refused to wear a mask. Um, it was reported that he refused to wear a mask, um, in the performance center. And, um, it was also reported that he was suspended earlier this year and banned from the Capitol Wrestling Center for a time. And somebody found screenshots of him last November, um, being a supporter of the Proud Boys and QAnon, and if you do watch the news, you do know who these people are. Um, I won't get into it on here, but just know that it's really problematic that you're a part of that. You know, you you would follow these hateful groups or whatever. And he also brought more heat upon himself um, after trying to weasel his way into certain roles backstage and he also had multiple issues with people of color in the company and almost got into a fight with EJ Nduka, whose real name is Ezra Judge. And I believe he also got released, too. So the last straw that for me that really kind of just hit hit it for me was when they reported that Triple H was giving a speech about Black Lives Matter last year, talking about different races and religions being welcomed into WWE. He reportedly aggressively gathered his stuff and left and he was really critical of any wrestlers who decided to get the COVID-19 vaccine so needless to say this guy was just a pretty hateful person and he was very problematic and when those you know and when the reports started coming out earlier before he got released I was wondering you know if if there was some way shape or form of which he could possibly you know allow other wrestlers of color to get put in danger and i would watch for that on television but then again that would never happen on tv so but at the very least at least you know we don't have to worry about that happening now because he's gone and then today it was breaking news a couple of hours ago that the velveteen dream aka patrick um clark has been released from wwe and his is definitely definitely notorious in the idea that he got caught um, possibly sending inappropriate pictures to underage girls. And since then, you know, he was kind of off and on on television. He was kind of on TV sometimes, but then off TV for another time and back on TV because um, he was hated and stuff like that. And he had turned heel to being back off TV permanently. And the last time anybody saw him, it had to be probably around November or December of last year. And he had basically just been benched. So now it's official. He's released now. And it's such a shame that you got caught up in the okie doke because he was one of the favorites that a lot of fa a lot of fans really love him he was one of the favorites to get called up to the main roster at some point or to possibly win the nxt championship at some point he was the nxt north american champion like there was so much that he so much potential that he had considering that he really came from tough enough and he was known as one of the most arrogant people on the show but he knew that he was really good and he knew what he had to offer was good and then when he created this character it was like you know him being this androgynous character it was one of the best um androgynous characters that wwe ever had but he got caught up so now he's gone and 
it's really a shame when so many people get released at a time because you want the best for all these talented people. But ultimately, you know, it's not up to us as fans. It's always up to, you know, the business, because at the end of the day, WWE, you know, they may really care about these people. But at the end of the day, it's a business. So you have to cut your losses. And I really hope the best for um, some of these least problematic people who got released. Now, the other problematic ones. uh, Goodbye. So, yeah. Also in the news, we have um, Las Vegas being a lead candidate for um, SummerSlam to take place. And it was reported by Dave Meltzer, who we sort of take as, you know, somebody who has news, but with a grain of salt, um, because he doesn't necessarily have like the best, you know, confirmation of things. Um, He confirmed that Allegiant Stadium in Paradise, Nevada is the leading candidate to host SummerSlam this year. And um, it was also stated via the Wrestling Observer that that the um, stadium is the home of the NFL's Las Vegas Raiders, who is my boyfriend's favorite football team. Um, (laughs) um, And then Sports Illustrated's Justin Barraza reported on Thursday that it will take place in Nevada this August, but didn't exactly state which city or which venue was going to be hosting the event. So it's also being reported that they're going to have a live crowd there as well, just like they did for WrestleMania this year. And it's also reported that Money in the Bank is supposed to be held in Texas with a live audience as well. So it was reported um, a few, I want to say last month, that they're going to try to get back to touring, um, maybe. So I feel like this might be a good start to sort of start with some of your bigger pay-per-views first and then ease into touring because, of course, COVID is still a very real thing. Even though people are getting their vaccines and stuff, you know, it's still good to be safe. So I think it's cool that at the very least they're trying. Um to give people something. So if that's the case, then that's really cool that you're having, you know, SummerSlam in a place like Las Vegas, you know, where there's so much to do. There's all this, there's the strip, there's the glamour of all the casinos and stuff. So I think that's amazing. Um, Also in the news, we have Jazz um, talking about possibly going into the WWE Hall of Fame. I was actually lucky enough to meet Jazz this past weekend (laughs) at the Belladonna Division show Genesis. She is such a nice woman and she's just so talented. And I'm lucky to even be breathing the same, to even have been breathing the same air as her and even commentating a tag team match that she participated in with The Woad as her partner up against Heather Monroe and Ray Lynn. Like shout out to those girls. Um, I was so happy to have met her. She's so nice. So she, um talked to the angle podcast and she discussed you know possibly taking her place in the hall of fame and she said that it's something that she would like to be a part of while she's still here on this earth and she's quoted as saying me being a hall of famer for wwe i don't know i mean i don't know if that will ever happen i just want to say this if it's ever going to happen do it while i'm alive don't wait until i'm dead and gone I would like to be there and share that moment with my kids. Don't bring my kids up on the stage with tears in their eyes, wishing their mom was there to receive this. Give me my flowers while I live. Don't let me die and be forgotten about. And then, oh yeah, here. If it were to happen, I would love to be inducted by Paul Heyman. And it's good that she said that because in terms of Paul Heyman, He brought a lot of people into the wrestling business, and he's also responsible for bringing her through ECW, um, which was his baby, you know. And while she was at ECW, she joined the Impact Players alongside Lance Storm, Just Incredible, and Jason Knight. Um, And then she left the company before before it filed for bankruptcy. And she competed in WWE from 2001 to 2004, where she faced... Hall of Famers such as Lita, Trish Stratus, Molly Holly, and Jacqueline. And, you know, she made all kinds of history and she is one of the reasons why we why we even have women like Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair and so many other black female wrestlers doing their thing all across the Indies and stuff like that. So I would love for WWE to actually give her her flowers while she's here because they do be given giving women you know hall of fame stuff when 
they're not here, you know, when they've passed on. And I would love for her to give her speech and tell her story, you know, from her perspective. So that would be really, really cool. I would actually say that maybe Teddy Long should induct her into the Hall of Fame. But that's just me. So, <laughs> yeah, um, that was a cool thing to see. And I'm just really happy to have actually met her. If you want to see the picture we took together, you can look on my social medias and, and check that out. That was amazing. And I'm going to talk more about that in my next episode. So also in the news, we have Thea Trinidad, um, formerly known as Zelina Vega, possibly returning um, to the main roster in WWE. So it was reported by Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful Select that she might be returning to WWE because they saw her um, reportedly returning to the Performance Center. No one knows why exactly. Um, she may be making a return. She might have been bringing um, Alistair Black something because he's set to make his return to the ring pretty soon with all his vignettes at um, SmackDown and stuff. Or she could be, you know, recording stuff for a some type of documentary of sorts that they might be doing on Simone Johnson. That's what the rumors are. Um, so according to Steve Carrier of Ringside News, um, that it might be she might be returning to the main roster and not just going through NXT. And no one knows if she's going to come back as a performer, as a wrestler, like she was before she got fired last year, or if she's going to be a manager for Aleister Black. I mean, either way, I feel like she has the personality and the fire and the talent to do it. And if she truly is coming back, I'll be so happy because I miss her. Um, like I seriously miss her. Like I love me some Zelina Vega and I've talked about it multiple times on the show. So if she's returning, then please let her return. Please make her come back. Um, also, um, speaking of Simone Johnson, the rock's daughter, um, she's reportedly making great progress at the performance center, um, as she trains for her eventual debut. Um, she was reported as being the most improved developmental talent in squats, for a period of January um, up until May of this year. And um, it was reported that the second most improved in squats was Skylar Story. Um, but she had just been released, you know, yesterday as well. And it was reported that she, you know, began training at the Performance Center and that she had signed a contract. So I think it's really cool that um, she, I believe she's the first um, fourth generation person to wrestle for the WWE at this point because she comes of course from a long line of amazing wrestlers in terms of um the my Vias and also in terms of you know the rock and his father as well so I'm all for other I'm all for supporting women of color wrestlers and she definitely represents you know two different you know races in terms of being black and Samoan so I'm really happy for her and I'm glad that she's making great progress and lastly, on the docket for news, we have um, AEW Rampage, you know, to debut on TNT on August the 13th and AEW Dynamite moving to TBS in January of next year. So All Elite Wrestling announced that um, they're going to create a new television show, um, a new television show called AEW Rampage that will debut on TNT on August the 13th at 10 p.m. Eastern. And that's a uh, Friday, I believe. And it's going to be an hour long show and is going to join Dynamite as AEW's second weekly television show. And Dynamite, um, which has been on Wednesday nights on TNT since it started, is going to be moving to TBS starting next year. So additionally, AEW is also going to have four new professional wrestling specials annually on TNT. So Patrick Hypes from Deadline, um, talk to Tony Khan, the CEO of AEW, following the the forthcoming additions and changes. So um, he said, as a lifelong wrestling aficionado who's privileged to present AEW to longtime and new fans alike, it means a lot to me personally and professionally to share the news that AEW will call TBS home beginning in 2022. The history of wrestling in the United States cannot be told without acknowledging the contributions of TBS, which as WTBS years ago, delivered wrestling to the Southeast and eventually to a massive national audience. TBS has um, the same passion for wrestling today, but will offer AEW and our fans more primetime programming, content and global opportunities that will establish TBS as the world's undisputed destination for wrestling. And... 
It's also interesting that Rampage is going to come on on Friday nights after SmackDown goes off. And this isn't me trying to be really messy or trying to stir a pot or whatever, you know, do a whole war thing because Triple H has definitely said, you know, that there was no war going on or whatever between AEW and WWE. But there's someone in the AEW circle um, who has a tendency to talk about WWE and talk about, you know, how AEW sent NXT running to a completely different night in terms of Tuesdays. And... I just feel that if you feel like AEW has all this smoke, then if you were going to put a show on um, the same night as a WWE show, why don't you just put them on at the same time just so you could see exactly how they could go um, in terms of the main roster show like Raw or SmackDown? But I guess they didn't want to do that. They just wanted to put it afterwards. So I guess maybe they really don't want any type of smoke at all. Or they just want to just do something different. I don't know. So, AEW is going to have more and more stuff going on. And that's a good thing for people who are huge fans of AEW. So, that's going to be good for them. And that's all for news and gossipish. And now we're going to go to my special interview with Mani Motati and, J- and Jason Cosmita's The Curtain Call Kids. All right, so um, in this special interview for the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, I have two very special guests on the 25th anniversary of their um, curtain call video being recorded. We have Manny Matati and Jason Cosmetis. How are you guys doing? Hey, Stephanie. Hey. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. Great. We're good. Great. So I'm going to ask you a question that I ask all of my guests. And that's when did the both of you fall in love with wrestling? For me, it was 1987 and been watching since. It's been a lifelong dream of mine just to be a wrestling fan. I mean, that was like my biggest passion in life was just wrestling and everything about it inside and outside the business as well. And uh, for me, I would probably say around the same time, I remember my first memory of watching pro wrestling was like Saturday night's main event. Uh, I remember uh, remember seeing like Andre and Hogan and I just became just hooked on it after that. And um, that's, that's, that's how far I go back. Okay. So who were some of your favorite wrestling stars, you know, growing up as you were watching it back then? Oh, for me, I would say uh, the Hulk, you know, Hulk Hogan, uh, Ultimate Warrior, um, you know, Demolition, uh, Mr. Perfect. uh, Who else? Let's see. Uh, You know, and then then it became it became, uh, you know, the new generation like uh, Brett the Hitman Hart, Diesel, uh, Kevin Nash, Razor Ramon. Uh, yeah, that that that's that's those are the ones that stick out for me. What about you, Manny? Well, obviously, you know, of all time, Shawn Michaels. But if you go back, Demolition, of course, you know, Rick Rude, Ted DiBiase, Macho Warrior, you know, Jake. I mean, you can't forget that. Most of the guys from the '80s, but if you know, start going in the '90s, you know, Mike Awesome. You know, uh, just about everybody in ECW. Okay, so those are pretty solid favorites there. Um, It's like you sort of mentioned the who's who of basically people. A lot of people that would be recognizable amongst, you know, various um, fan groups and just people who aren't even really like fan things, you know. So those are really solid choices there. Um, So were your family members ever into wrestling at all or was it just a you guys thing? Well, me and my brother used to go to uh, shows a lot, and uh, then Jason became my new brother, and we started going to shows a lot. And my dad used to take me to uh, ECW events, and then me and Jay used to go to ECW events, as well as WWF and WCW shows. Yeah, no, for me, it was uh, it was just me and, and my house. Uh, I think I tried to get my brother involved with it, but 
uh no he wasn't he wasn't interested and then you know i went to a few events i was, I was young so you know my, my dad went and then as it got older i went with my friends you know met manny in high school and and we started going to, to house shows and and he introduced me to ecw went to ecw and uh pay-per-views and and yeah that's pretty much uh that's pretty much uh you know my uh, my history with uh going to uh going to events and being a fan okay so you guys mentioned how you went to ecw shows were those pretty mm -hmm. wild because from what i see from different old clips and stuff <laughs> those shows were kind of crazy so how how were your experiences with ecw shows my first ecw show was february 3rd of 1996 in queens new york me and my dad we brought a bag of course of beer a boxing glove light bulbs some other <laughs> weapons that you were allowed to bring in at the time and you know a couple of the wrestlers did actually use some of the stuff that we were that was in our bags which is awesome because that's wow. what i saw that that they were doing in philly and i was like you know what let's do that you know let's bring in all these weapons and and see if they use it which they did and it was such an amazing experience seeing all those guys because when I when I was going to those shows, I was like, oh, I know these guys from the 80s. I know these these guys were in the WWF or WCW and now they're here. This is cool, you know? Mm -hmm. Shane Douglas is here. You know, it's like, oh, awesome. Wow. That's pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah. Um, as far as like ECW goes, I mean, Manny introduced me to ECW as like an alternative wrestling product. And I was just so hooked on it. I was so fascinated that the, the edginess, as wild as, as it was, uh, the reality based, it seemed the music was real. They played real hip hop. They played real rock. It wasn't it wasn't your, you know, it wasn't the type it was just they didn't make their own music. It was me, real music heard on the radio. Um, and it was just it was just uh, an, an awesome experience. When we went to our first show is the best way I can describe it. And you know, got to understand times were a lot different back then. I mean, um, it was like it was like going to a wrestling event uh, and a rock concert at the same time. And um, the wrestlers would would you know get in the crowd and it just it's like you were part you were part of the show like you know. Um, and it took a couple of years for for uh, WWF and WCW to kind of catch on to that that fans actually enjoyed that stuff you know yeah that just sounds really cool to actually be a participant you know in the audience you know in that mm -hmm. way so i'm i imagine it has to be a beautiful time to sort of reminisce on and sort of remember because of course you know um one of the only ways that some of us can really only you know interact um well now because of the pandemic is right. through you know being a part of the audience digitally but then even when stuff was normal it's like we would do certain chants and sometimes the wrestlers will react and stuff like that but it wasn't ever anything that much interactive you know for fear of you know different things popping off and different things happening because some fans can get a little bit wild and you know jump in the, sh the show and stuff like that yeah. so it's cool that that you guys had that experience so um how how many how many wrestling events would you say you guys had went to before um, the one that subsequently changed your life? You mean together or just in Together general? or in basically together? Well, I met Manny in 1994. Um, I was going to the house shows with another uh, high school friend of ours. Um, and Manny and I started going, I want to say we started going to some events at MSG in late 1995. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we went to a few shows. That's when I started to record a, a few of the house shows to bring the, um, the, the, the camp corner. I'm sure we'll get more in, into that. But um, and then there was a yeah, I would say about maybe three or four uh house shows around the new york area that we went to and you have to understand at, at that time nothing really happened much at house shows all the all the 
anything that would happen like title changes or heel turns would usually happen on TV. The house shows were kind of a tour, you know, they would go from city to city. So you really didn't see much. And um, I remember, I think at some point, I don't know, at some point Manny was like, you know, why are you taping this for? <laughs> Nothing happens, you know, you know this, you, you've been to these shows nothing ever happens you know it's, you're wasting your time you you're know? wasting you know? your time you're <laughs> what, you're what are you you're doing this same results every night and <laughs> the title changes and then a minute later goes back to the person you know it's like it's a house show what do you expect stop doing this you know it's not worth it <laughs> you're you're, you're risking yourself getting caught and taking your, your camera away you know and i'm i'm glad he didn't listen to me because otherwise <laughs> we wouldn't be here if he would have listened to me then i would have <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> and it's so funny because even when you go to house shows now um so i was just telling jason earlier manny that i'm from birmingham um and so whenever yes. house shows come here you know it's still cool to go see you know even though you know it's not the live television show but at the same time it's like you know that basically nothing major is going to change except maybe a couple of times like it's been a couple of times in the mo in more recent years where stuff has changed, you know, and titles have changed and stuff like that, but it's really, right. really rare. Right. So it's just, you know, it's just really cool. You know, I actually enjoy going to house shows um, and I really just miss live shows, period, at this point. Like I cannot oh. wait until everything sort of, you know, gets back to normal so we can start going to live shows again because those are just my favorite things um, to yeah. do. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. You, yeah. you're saying you and everybody else so believe me once once they can start filling the seats yeah they're gonna have sold out sold out shows um no doubt about that a lot of people miss that yeah definitely like i was happy to see live fans at wrestlemania this year even though mm -hmm. it was so few and stuff like that but it's just the principle of just seeing them there like that was really good like that, yeah that made me feel the fans happy. mean a lot the fans mean a lot i mean even before the pandemic some of the shows were piped in crowd noise. I couldn't get with that. Now it's like, okay, you're invited to Thunderdome. You can you can do this. You can do this. You can't do that. Can't do that. There's ten things you can't do. You can't wear this type of shirt. You can't do this on camera. This, and otherwise they'll just boot you. You have to cheer for who you. They want you to cheer. You have to boo for who they want you to be. Boo. It's like, oh man, that's too much. There's too much to take in. Yeah, yeah. it's a lot. Um, but it, I feel, you know, good about the idea that at least there is still trying to find ways to include us and still make it fun. Some way, in some way, yeah. Yeah, in some way. All right. So I wanted to ask you, had you both known the existence of the click before um, the moment happened that you guys caught on camera? Not at all. I mean, the only... No. No, the only thing we saw is what was on TV with Razor and Diesel being friends and Sean and Diesel being friends. Just what we saw on camera. Nothing about Hunter anyway. And I had a 800 hotline back then and I had no idea that Hunter was friends with all of them. And I had to know everything back then because I had to update the hotline every day. And uh, no, we had no idea. Okay, so what type of hotline was this? Because you mentioned that, and I don't, I don't exactly know what that is. Because around that time, I was like maybe two years old. So, <laughs> what was that? Back then, it was. Uh, I started around like '96. It was an 800 hotline, which I had three lines. One was a 1-800 news line. The other one was a question and answer hotline, where the fans call in and then I answer their questions. And then the third one was a merchandise hotline, where they can buy tapes or VHS copies for me for certain shows and it, it got pretty popular because I actually got the number on Raw on a sign when I was in the front row and that helped it out a lot a lot too. Back before when uh, back then we had basically just wrestling hotlines where you would call into or dirt sheet writers. Now it's all you know podcasts and I love the way it's coming to and the, and the uh, internet news sites but that's what we had back then. Those were the only two choices with the hotlines and and the dirt cheap writers where you would sign up and you get it in the mail, all the news that's happening. Yeah, and most of the time when we got them, it was late. 
<laughs> you know? Yes. Like, that's stuff thing. already happened. It's like, we're reading it and it's like, what, wait, we already know that, that you know, they're, they're uh, telling us the, the raw results, you know, the superstar results because they already, they already happened, you know, because a lot of the times they did the, the recordings and or tapings and it was like weeks out. So... Okay, so if that was the case, then I would. Is it safe to assume that you guys may or may not have known that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash were leaving WWE to go to WCW? Well, and a many weird, are. weird story, which I know Scott Hall never has admitted, and I know Kevin Nash, Kevin Nash hasn't admitted. You know, Scott Hall says his ninety-day clause he gave, which would have been February or whatever it was, but. I used to call Howard Finkel's wrestling hotline and he used to update house shows when this wrestler is appearing here and there. Mm-hmm. And randomly he blurted out, oh, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash are assigned to WCW. And it was just out of random because he would never give that kind of information out. And not only that, nobody knew their real names at the time, but I did because I had a wrestling hotline, so I had to know everything. And all this time, it, that's like, and this was back in January. So February, March, April, May, that's like five months. I know these guys are selling out, they're leaving us. And I'm so pissed. And like, I knew they were gonna be jobbed out o- over the next months and I see what's going on. And so I knew it for a, I knew it for a long time there. I mean, Scott Hall has always, always said he gave his 90 days, but it was more than that because I, I believe Howard Finkel's word was true. Hmm. Wow, that's a that's a lot. So, can you both describe how it how you how the both of you you know felt that night when you watched the click embrace each other um, that night in 1996? Okay, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, shocked, you know. We we were I uh, was definitely shocked uh, because wrestling back then was was very black and white good guy bad guy you never saw them shaking hands after the match um it just was just out of the ordinary you know and hugging kissing in the ring and we're like what what the hell is going on and you know then you see you see hunter come in you see razor and they're doing this 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 click sign and it was just it was just it's just shocking you know and um we were just i mean manny was definitely if you heard he had the true raw react fan, you know raw emotion that a lot of us were were feeling that that <laughs> night you know i mean the annoying kid the annoying, <laughs> annoying screaming kid <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, I won't yeah. say you were being annoying, though, because I won't say that because I probably would have reacted the same way. So I can't even pretend that I'm not it, loud. So it's OK. It was actually magical because usually I'm not that vocal. I'm usually a shy person. But that that whole card was amazing. I mean, it was magic. Going into it, we didn't think much. It was just, OK, cage match, Sean Diesel. But, you know, you had you had Steve Austin going up against um, Jake Roberts, and you had that's when he was starting to become Stone Cold Steve Austin. You had the return of the Ultimate Warrior at Madison Square Garden facing Owen Hart, which yep. happened to he broke his broke his wrist. Yeah, that's why you see him wear his cast all the time after that because that shoulder tackle that the Warrior gave him. It was the night the tag team titles changed and stayed changed yes. at, at the Garden, and, th- and that was on Raw the next yeah the next day. But showed- that was that was pure pure emotion you know because it just mind blew me not just when it's like face turn heel turn when Diesel lost he was a heel and then a couple seconds later Michaels embraced him okay so here you go Kevin Nash now he's face again and Scott uh, Scott Hall comes out all right this is cool and then when Hunter comes out it's like mind blowing because why is he even coming out you know it's like what's the point of this and it, it was incredible that night and we purposely sat in the 300 sections all the way on top so we wouldn't get caught with the camera or we wouldn't get it <laughs> Man, taken he away I, and he knew I had that figured out I had that uh, yeah can't get too Jason, close with a camera that, that was Jason's idea no let's not sit in the 200 
let's not in the 100s you know that's where all the lights are everybody sees us we, he purposely got us tickets for 300s let's sit far back nowadays it's different like in the last few years we were always in the front row but back then we purposely went in the back and jay i want you to tell the story that how everybody thinks we sneaked in or smuggled in the cameras why don't you tell them how we really got it in cuz yours what you tell me all the time is like the actual truth yeah yeah um yeah but i i didn't want to say about uh like many said it wasn't just the um the cage match the curtain call that was special that night the whole the whole event was special i mean it felt like a pay-per-view event and it was a house show and it was non-televised and that's what we were like we were really excited about about going i mean a sunday night is a school night you know normally our parents would be like no you're you're not going to to new york city which was <laughs> like about a little over an hour train ride away um you know it was a school night i mean it was like in may it was almost the end of the year finals were coming up and uh we really wanted to go and and we're 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 glad that we did but um as going back to with 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 the camera a lot of people think that the cameras on like today they're you know on your cell phone or they're ver- they're like pocket cams they're just uh sorry they're just easy to uh you yeah, they're just more you know uh, portable back then the the VHS cameras gen- generally were 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 bigger i had a VHS C camera which was like half the size and the little tapes actually fit in like this little shell that you would play in a um <laughs> sorry you would actually play in a in a regular VHS in a VHS uh player so the camera wasn't that big it wasn't that heavy it actually fit in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a camera bag and just enough that i had enough batteries and tape to tape about 2 hours maybe 2 and a half hours of the of the uh the event so um on uh if many remembers on extended play the poor quality yes, but you EP, get more yeah. you get 6 EP, hours you, on, you a, get, on that one 6 <laughs> 4 and 2 <laughs> lp sp yeah, and slp <laughs> yeah i schooled manny on that and he was like he thought i was crazy and i said no you have to pay attention to this stuff <laughs> you know otherwise you're never going to run out of tape and um but uh yeah i mean I, so that's how i figured to figure out enough battery enough tape and we almost didn't capture the curtain call yes because i was in almost idiot. didn't capture and I, really? and i was i was i was pressuring jason to film us starting the Scott Hall you sold out chat because I was so pissed off that he was leaving and I started this chat and we were in the 300 section I'm starting this chat like nobody's following and then after a while few people start chanting it's like how can you be the one that start the chat and also film the curtain call it's true and then finally the whole crowd started chanting it, and I was like Jay did you get that no he actually cut off the cameras and I was so upset at him I'm like why did you do that but he did it for the right right reasons and he his mind was somewhere else he he probably said to himself i got to get this cage match on tape in its entirety and if it wasn't for yeah. that then he maybe he would have gotten the full finish to the match but he wouldn't have gotten the current call and then we wouldn't be here right right the yeah the battery or the or i would have ran out of tape it was it was cutting it pretty close battery or um, tape and i'm glad all these times he didn't listen to me <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. I feel like actually my best friend would appreciate this part of the conversation cuz she's a photographer and she records things. So I'm pretty sure she would appreciate okay. that entire this entire component about you having a smaller camera and just being able to get that in there. Like that is amazing. <laughs> and you oh, didn't man. mention how you you didn't even mention how you got it in though. You you have to tell them that. <laughs> How you got the camera in all the um, time? 6 7 times we well, did it. I, I, right? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and I had a it was a regular it was it was a small bag and it was just I don't know what else I had inside the the bag maybe drinks or food or something but I was able just and the, the, I remember at the garden they were like what's this and I said oh, it's just a regular it's just a camera. All right, you know. And there was an incident uh like a boxing incident that happened where there was like a riot that broke out. I believe it was like late 95 or early 96 and I remember the security was even more tight at the garden for like for for uh 
events in general mm -hmm. so i i actually i said well they may not you know they, they may not even let us in with this thing and then what do i do you know um, but to my to my recollection we never planned like okay let's hide this camera here let's hide this you got your tapes hide light them here i remember right. we just walk in you had your camera on your side this and that because the, the security would never think that a 16 17 year olds would go in and videotape a, a house show for what reason they need to right you you would just open it up and if they actually asked you would actually open it and say oh it's just a video camera and then they look at it and they let you go and we just walked in we never smuggled we never right. hit it we never planned it we never said oh we might get caught but that was not on our mind our mind was let's go in enjoy the show and tape the show okay yeah see now i don't think that would happen but or at least here in birmingham that would not happen but basically what you're saying is they just let you in with the camera because they just didn't expect anything bad out yeah we the never hid the camera that's yeah. cool that is really that's cool yeah. i know being in madison square garden had to be amazing too that's like the mecca of wrestling right oh yeah oh my god every time it felt it felt like special you know and and they they always put on a good show there you know especially especially the uh the cage matches um cage matches were rare for house shows i don't know and and it was just yeah. it was just special to um to 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 go and to see it live especially the the old cage you know they don't they don't do those cage matches anymore no not that the stuff cage. of course mm -hmm. Yeah, well, maybe one day I'll make it. We'll see. And I'll possibly see Barclays, too. Well, you never know. So yes. did you ever expect the footage to reach WWE in any way? Well, it actually leaked out accidentally to a dirt sheet writer. Well, not accidentally, but I, Deliberately. I was upset. At, <laughs> yeah, I was upset at Jay and I I leaked it out to well, a it, yeah, dirt I sheet mean... writer. I made a copy for him not knowing he was going to screw us over and then boom it airs october of 97 raw not knowing that we're going to see our own footage here we are oh wow it's like what what is this that's our footage why is it doing that two things i was upset about one was the fact that they aired our footage and i had no knowledge of that it was going to air and why was this not this footage stolen and two they blocked out our voice but the other thing was I thought about was like, wait a second, why is WWE's quality so bad? Because it's been copied over and over and over and over. And that was the first time it ever aired anywhere. And then years later is when it actually blew up. It never blew up until like the 2000s later now. And now, now it's like ridiculous because nobody mentioned back then oh you guys are responsible for taping that you guys are responsible for austin 316 you guys are responsible for the attitude era yeah. this a triple h punish this that none of that came to light until like a few years ago i don't take responsibility for that i think it would have happened anyway but it's right. nice to know that people think of that but they're the quality of their tape when they aired it, it was like oh at least they could have gotten a nice quality tape of it and uh, speaking of the tape, I might have one right next to me that could be the original. That's oh. <laughs> boom! Oh, look at that! Uh -huh. look, that is so the, cool. Uh, these are yeah, these are the regular stickers from the magazines from the nineties. Uh -huh. Because Stephanie, back then, it wasn't considered the curtain call. People didn't call it anything except maybe farewell to the click. So yeah. I just called it. And Jason just called it MSG bootleg or MSG uh, fair, um, what would we call it? The click tape. It's on a VHS tape with other stuff on it. And this, this tape has only been viewed three times to protect its quality. Uh huh. And that's why the tab is ripped off so it can't be recorded over. But this is, this is the tape actually. Oh. <laughs> so that, so this is the part that A and E didn't, I guess, because of time or whatever. They mm -hmm. ended my one hour interview into two minutes, which is cool still, but they didn't air this part. But here you are seeing this live and in person. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's the current, yeah, that's the current doll tape. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm a sucker for nostalgia. <laughs> all, all, all thanks to Jason. He did this for me. Wow. That is so cool. So did so basically the company didn't necessarily reach out to you guys in any way, you know, after that point back then, but had they reached out to you like years after the fact? The the thing is, I never acknowledged that me and Jason were the guys that filmed the current call for many, many years, maybe 10, 15 years or whatever it was, because just I was so upset how it got leaked out. So I never really reached out to WWE or anything like that. It was it was Jason that I think back in 2014 that reached out to them and said when they posted the, the video of the curtain call that, hey, we were the guys, me and Manny filmed this footage. That's when the WWE content contacted us for the first time in 2000, late 2014 for a click DVD that was coming out. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I would not even tell my friends, like even my close friends, my wrestling friends, the people I did pro wrestling with, anybody, I would just take it out of my mind like I, it never existed because of the fact of how it leaked. So it bothered me a lot. But now I'm just, I'm open to it. I'm, I talk to all the fans, I, everybody that messages me every day. And it's it's nice. It's a nice feeling to know. But But the thing is, I always say this, most people don't, most people think I'm the guy that just filmed the current call and that's it. But Jason was the one that actually filmed it. He's the one that brought the camera. I was just tagging along as, you know, it was just, it was just so much fun doing those things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Manny is, is spot on when he says, uh, he says about, you know, about not getting noticed. I, I don't think it really, once the video was out there, I don't think anybody really cared who did it as long as there was a video out there and it didn't really make sense. Who would believe us anyway, you know, mm -hmm. back in the late 90s, early 2000s, who would who would believe us? I mean, they would say, All right, what, what's your proof then? What's your proof, you know? Oh, I have a video. Yeah, so do I, I have a video too, you know? How do I know yours is, is, is legit? And, um, you know, so I, I was kind of like, man, we just kind of just, forgot about it you know it was it's already out there and let, let it be let, let it be and we'll nobody would um uh, is going to acknowledge us um and and in 2014 it was on the website um mm -hmm. they interviewed the some of the the the, the rustlers superstars sorry we can't say rustlers right manny we got to say yes we got to say superstars they, they superstars. corrected us once yeah <laughs> and um so uh and there was a comment section. I don't know if they do that now, but there was a comment section, and I wrote, I wrote in, "Hey, this is this is uh, me and my friend Manny. We we filmed this. Uh, if anybody's interested, please, please, uh, please contact me." And I didn't think anybody was going to. I thought they would have deleted it, thought of it like a joke or something. And then months later, I got a uh, an email on my LinkedIn from a producer. Hey, is this the Jason Cosmetics who filmed the curtain call? And I said wow is this wow this is real you know but i didn't understand why they wanted to con contact me because they already had the footage they already had it on dvds they just had a click episode on the monday night war series mm -hmm. and i thought if that was our chance you know that was it what else are they gonna do and the guy said no no we're, we're gonna do a dvd we want to interview you guys are you available and I said, yeah, we're available, you know? And uh, I said, where are you located? I said, I'm in, I'm in Florida. And he said, all right, well, you're going to be in New York? I said, no, but if you'll fly me up, I'll, I'll come up. And he said, no, that's not, that's not fine. I said, I said, for real, you know? But anyway, but so they interviewed me down here when they were uh, in SmackDown, down here in, in, uh, in Florida. And um, so I did my interview there. Manny did his up in uh, Connecticut. He was able to go to the, the headquarters and, and do it there, which was awesome. I'm kind of jealous about that. I wish we were together. That would have been very cool. Now, looking back in hindsight, I probably should have flew up, but at the time, you know, I wasn't thinking about that. Um, but yeah, that's that's how we got recognized. Finally, officially, we got recognized. We could have, We could say that. We're, uh, we're officially recognized by WWE, you know? And, the, and the crazy part of that story is when I first walked into the WWE studios in Stafford, Connecticut, Kieran, the WWE producer, 
He said, we've been looking for you guys for a while. I'm like, in my head, you could have found us so easily. We were yeah. already on Wikipedia or wherever. I was like, you serious? Wow. wow. And, yeah, and there, yeah. there's a guy working there that knew who we were. Of course, because he's the one that played the <laughs> rib on me on the phone. By the time we got arrested with Triple H and uh, Scott Hall, it was actually Scott Hall's idea to get us arrested on backstage on Monday Night Raw, but it actually happened years before with our friend who works with WWE on the phone with me, told me, you know, since you taped it, you know, the WWE is going to send you a lawyer, um, a lawsuit, because because you acknowledged that you were the one that filmed it. I tried to get out of it, and after a while, he's like, oh, I'm just ribbing you. It's a joke. I'm like, oh, man, after all that. So, <laughs> and I... And, and I guess, like Manny said, I guess that was probably one of the fears we had is that there might be some legal ramifications. But I think because we were kids, we were under 18, I think we were good. And the fact that they're just using the video, I mean, if they were that bothered by it, why are they using it, you know? I mean, they got that thing all over the, you know, it's all over the place. They, they love it because they don't have their own, you know? Right. They, they turn... They turn their cameras off, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. And normally, you would think they would get something like that, but then they didn't. So it's just like, well, <laughs> it's yeah. theirs, you know. Just, let's just use it, and yeah. it's and it's it's cool that it turned out that way. So I can't even, you know, that's just an amazing story how that turned out for you guys. So I want to ask you: Do you feel that your footage? Um, was sort of the prerequisite for where kayfabe is or isn't um, in this day and age for wrestling in terms of social I, media and interviews. I think um, it helped break kayfabe and, you know, change the business for forever, as a lot of people like to say. I mean, I can always go with that, even though. But uh, can you imagine this if this happened let's say in the 1960s or the 1970s in professional wrestling, if we were the guys that filmed something like this happening, what would happen is we would get death threats from the promoters. We would be hated by the fans. We would be wanted to be killed by the fans for doing something like this in the 60s and 70s. But since it happened in the 90s, we're like loved all over by everybody. Yeah. And most of the comments and everything is positive oh you guys created attitude there you guys created stone cold steve Austin. you guys created uh, this that this that it's like okay i'll take it i mean <laughs> everything's positive now but if it was back then can you imagine we wouldn't be alive today we'd be killed <laughs> yeah yeah and and it's manny it's funny that you that uh, one of the things i wanted to to mention uh, I still didn't, unfortunately, I still didn't finish watching the full Shawn Michaels documentary. I think I'm about halfway. One of the okay. things, and I, I, didn't, I didn't even know about this, is that the Rockers won the tag team titles. Of and, they, course. and then they took it away from them. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's kind of, and, and that was, but it was not televised. But there was people there in the, in the, in the audience that saw that. So what it, like, what it say? Oh, it didn't really happen? It's fake news? It, you know? Yeah, it's like it didn't really happen. Even WWE shows it all the time now. It's like the titles changed that night. They were cha they were actually champions. It's kind of like Andre the Giant winning the world title. It's like he won it for you know whatever it was for a day, whatever they so gave it to DiBiase. Right. They didn't want to acknowledge it, then they did, and then now it's official that he is. And then it's like the Rockers were actually tag team champions. Right. 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 And then it's like, and then it's like the way I feel about it now is just, I feel like what you guys did sort of triggered, you know, how we sort of watch wrestling now in terms of, like we mentioned earlier with house shows and then with a lot of the stars on social media, you know, sharing, you know, a little bit more of their lives and not really, and basically giving off the impression that who they are is basically sort of separate from who they would be on television or sometimes they'll utilize social media to sort of feed into their personality on TV. So I really think that, that, that your footage, you know, is a part of that. And I feel like you guys deserve all the credit <laughs> um, for that, definitely. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I I did want to answer. I I know, um, I didn't quite answer the the question that you had. But do I think it's it it started it? I mean, it it definitely kicked it off where it was like, okay, there is some behind the scenes stuff that fans were want to know about, you know. 
Um, but do I think it's becoming too much? Yeah, but that's largely due to the internet and social media and everybody's a busy body and needs to know. And, you know, they say inquiring minds want to know. So I just think that that's, that's the world that we, we live in. Even you've seen in pro sports now, you know, it's like, it's not just, you know, uh, ball players, you know, they just go on and play ball, you know, whether they're wh whatever sport you are, there's always, oh, they have social media, they're doing this, they're doing that, you know, um, they're more engaged, you know, it's not just, uh, this is your fictional character on TV and, and that's it, you know, then you go and live your life. I mean, man, man, he'll tell you, we saw Cac Cactus Jack Mankind at S Sabaro's with his family eating pizza uh, at the Sunrise Mall before he was in, yeah, before he was in, in, in WWE and like, and nobody was, he was just there. He was just chilling with his family and, and we went up to him, hey, are you, you Cactus Jack? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and, and we just thought that was so cool, such a real moment, but I think, you know, nowadays everybody would be pulling out their phones and want to take pictures and selfies. And, and we were just so, so cool about it with him. Right. I mean, I think what his, when his daughter is probably there, I think she's a wrestler now. Yeah. And the best <laughs> part of that, that day is I'll never forget from any wrestler. Cause you know, back then it was only dirt sheets and everything. You know, I bluntly asked him, you know, as a, I was 16, whatever it was at the time. I was like, Hey, are you ever going to go to WWF? And, you know, he was in ECW at the time. He's like, well, probably in about a year. Without even hesitating, he told me the truth because it actually happened almost a year later. Boom, yeah. the promos came in for Mankind. I, he was so truthful and honest with me. And like, wow. And, and back then, it's like, oh, really? It's like I had a wrestling hotline then, and I didn't even tell anybody that, you know? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a nice thing. You know, he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And remember? Yeah. Remember a half hour later, he fought, he came to a store that we were at. He's like, hey, KB Toys. Guys KB Toys, yeah. Yeah. I miss that store. <laughs> what? <is it>? Yes. <laughs> I miss that store so much. See, you guys are way better than me because if I saw if I saw Mick Foley anywhere, my face would have just been froze the whole time, like, ah! <laughs> and I probably oh, yeah. just would have <laughs> smiled the whole time and just said, you know, how much I love him, and that's just it. Mm -hmm. Like. I'm terrible when sometimes I'm just really terrible when it comes to just saying stuff. It's just like anything will just come out of my mouth. Like whenever <laughs> I see somebody like that, it's it's crazy. Um, so did you guys ever, did you guys feel like the clique had every right to sort of embrace each other in that moment? Or do you feel that maybe they should have just kept kayfabe alive and just not done that for the sake of television because in the biography that Shawn michaels had this past sunday rick flair was on there and he mentioned that if that had happened just like you did Man manny if that had happened back then you know during his age during the 60s and 70s you know they would have been booed out of the building or just or possibly killed and all of that so do you guys feel like they should have embraced or do you feel that they should not have I feel like they should well, they, have, and it was done for the, it was done for the right reasons. It never, if you look at it now, it never hurt anybody. It only no. helped the business, you know. If anything, that helped us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I would say, um, yeah. I mean, not knowing, obviously now watching the 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 videos and the backstories, and um, you realize these guys were really close. They were a tight knit group that that was always together and they knew it was their last day of working with each other at least at that time so they wanted to do a send-off they wanted to say goodbye to everybody you know that was that was that was it so i mean hey they asked the boss and he said he said do it you know mm -hmm. and uh they 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 wound up they wound up doing it and um you know more 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 power to them i just wish those guys you know i think back i just say you know i wish one of those guys stayed that year because WWF went went to shit right after for a couple of years, and um, you know I I would say if I don't know I would say I wish Kevin Nash stayed. Uh, Scott Hall he had his his issues, but I wish uh, Kevin Nash stayed and because uh, this I know going off course here, but I, at the time, um, you know Brett wasn't there around that he left he took a little break um, after WrestleMania. 20 12 uh warrior was gone like a few weeks later and then 
uh, Scott Hall and, and, and Kevin Nash were all gone, you know, by by July. Um, and those were four big guys that were gone. And then then you had um, the outside. Then you had, you know, the bash at the beach when Hogan and they joined the NWO. That just WCW went through the roof after that. And as a wrestling fan, you're like, wow, they're they got the edge now you know at least for two years you know but yeah that was the new generation era at its low point yeah so essentially them leaving just triggered the month triggered the monday night war and everything that we know about it um i think you're probably the first person who's ever been on my show that called that basically outright said the wwe really wasn't (laughs) <laughs> anything back then you know after they had left at that point but I'm glad you guys feel that way about them embracing because I felt the same way myself I was just like you know if they were best friends let them have their moment <laughs> like let right, them hug right. each other I and mean, you know what gosh. I always thought what if the video didn't exist and only those three pictures that the people from ringside or a couple of fans would it have been as big I don't know I don't think so but I think the video helped. Yeah, it just would have been like one of those like urban legends, you know? Some people say it happened. Some people say it didn't happen. Um, And you see nowadays in the news, I mean, video, you have video, it's just so powerful, you know, says says so much. And uh, uh, what, you know, what what they did uh, that night was was something special. I mean, Manny will tell you um, before that, you know the best moment that i house show was when diesel won the belt you know when uh he wanted a match square garden against bob Backlund in like eight seconds and and uh and at that time i thought it was awesome looking back now i thought it was the dumbest idea because it made absolutely no sense from a wrestling storyline point of view where he just became he went from a bad guy of like a night or two before into a good guy into world champ and it's like there was no build up there was no build like, yeah. up Lex Luger slam yeah let's yeah. bring Lex Luger out <laughs> and slam yoga yeah. same thing yeah it just made no sense but i was i was a mark but it was I, cool but it was yeah, cool it was, was it awesome. was cool un, unexpected um and then you know obviously WWE they 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 taped it you know it was a short match but Manny got his hands on a bootleg of that event i was like wow you got a bootleg of this you know and man t- the quality was it was poor it was like a the generational loss and and uh what prompted me to start taping shows is that just buying a lot of these bootlegs from these tape traders that i spent pay like 20 25 bucks for of my you know my uh shoveling snow money which was a lot back then you know and it just was just poor quality it was like you know what? I can do a better job than this, and I will do a better job than this. You know? And he has. <laughs> yeah. You know, just didn't yeah. have no idea that I was going to be uh, taping the the most memorable uh, wrestling moment of the '90s. You know, or most controversial moment, if you want to. You know. Okay, so I want to ask you: How has it has this moment exactly changed your lives for? the better in terms of the present uh for me is that i actually acknowledge it now i used to just hide away from it for years now it's like pretty much an everyday thing because i get messages all the time all the time a lot of similar questions but that's okay too from fans all over but i'm okay with it now you know everything's good you know i'm okay with being known as the current call kid or being the guy that was annoying or was the screaming mark and you know jay was the guy with the camera going crazy so i'm i'm okay with it it's cool yeah same here i i don't really it doesn't really change me i just think it's cool you know to just just get recognized you know something we did as as a kid i mean if you told us back when at the time Hey, uh, you guys are going to be recognized. You guys will be on DVDs and such, and and podcasts and, and all that. I would have said, I would probably would have said, no way, you know. I probably would have, I, I wouldn't have been able to comprehend it. But um, 
you know, I'm not, I don't have, I don't have a, a presence really on social media. Um, I have a, just a Facebook page, but I just, you know, it's for family stuff. But um, no, nah, it's cool. I just, I read the comments on YouTube. Um, very interesting comments from fans. And I do, I do, um, I do reply from time to time. A lot of mis misconceptions, you know, that people feel they think we're like, you know, millionaires. They think, you know, they, they think that, um, that uh, you know, they just think that we that WD bought the rights or something. It's just, it's just, it's it's a lot of crazy stuff that that people think. But a lot of people don't realize is that uh, legally, um, what we did was wrong, and, and uh, you know, it just. Um, what about the it, confiscating comments? <laughs> oh, they confiscated the tape. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, they thought that they confiscated the tape that they, they 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 took everything from us and and then you know but um no but there was once where they did confiscate uh at a nasa coliseum got a little too close to the ring thought maybe i can film a little closer to the ring mm -hmm. and, and then like security guard said they basically said give me the tape and i had to had to give up the tape but uh fortunately it was a, a really weak house show you know good and and the, and i always mess with them i would say the reason why they took your tape because I wasn't with you at that one. You brought your other friend. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wasn't looking out for me, you know. But uh, yeah, just a lot of a lot of cool stuff, you know, a lot of cool cool comments, and it's just like I just think it's it's basically what's happening with everything t today. You know, n nostalgia is big. What what didn't seem as popular back then is now popular now because people, are, especially during the pandemic, they're reminiscing of the good times, you know, and. And I think that's that's very important that we all reflect that, yeah, the, you know, times were good and they will be good again, but we got to get there. Yes, you know? and WWE Network and Peacock Network is, is doing great things for as far as documentaries go, keeping people entertained. They're doing a great job. So much love to WWE for what they did for us and what they're doing. Well, that's pretty good to hear, you know, how it sort of affected your lives. But then it's good that you guys are just have that good relationship, you know, with them because of that event and how and just how, you know, it's impacted wrestling history even now because we're still talking about it. And that was 25 years ago today. So that's just a yeah. really cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> Manny's like, whoo. <laughs> yeah, but, it's funny. It's funny you say that because I'm. I think back. I'm like, well, if I was, if we were back in the mid '90s and somebody brought up something that happened, you know, 25 years ago, say like in the you know early '70s or late, I probably wouldn't have. I probably wouldn't have cared. I would have been like that. You know, what does that have to do with what happens today? You know, mm -hmm. but it's just different. It's just different. I think as as we're in this generation now where, you know, things things are just fresh with this digital age and things are online everything kind of stays fresh you know and people's minds so things kind of live a little bit longer than they than they used to definitely so um who are some of your favorite wrestlers now per se like male or female for me i would say uh i've been a big fan of Royal marines i like what he's doing I think that's okay. I like Roman Reigns too. I love what he's doing as well. It's really interesting. He's probably the most compelling he's been in like the past couple of years, and I love it so much. Um, I can't answer that because I don't really, I don't really watch wrestling. If I say Goldberg, I mean that's kind of you know Oldberg, but <laughs> you know he's still wrestling, so I guess you know that's uh. But much credit to him. He's, he's still going. But I guess he, or Brock Lesnar, you know, those guys are still going. Um, that's that's really it. I'm sorry. I wish I had, uh, you know, what's his name? The Miz. Is he mm -hmm. still wrestling? Yes, he is. He yeah. actually just got he injured, okay. though, injured for like the very first mm -hmm. time. Um, so he's out right now, but he is still wrestling. He's still active. Good. Yeah, there was a good documentary I was watching the other night on the WWE Network. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he 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 took a lot of crap on his way up. Uh, 
So he he paid his dues, you know, good for him. I didn't realize because he was on the reality show, the reality uh, was it the real world. And then he was on Tough Enough. And then he just was the, oh, you're the real world guy, you know. No, he but he, he, uh, he he deserves everything he's done, and you watch yeah. that. Yeah, you watch that WrestleMania 27 main event where he comes out and he fights Cena, even though he loses. That made him a star. He is a star, you know. Nobody can yeah. deny that. And I was at that WrestleMania too. That was in Atlanta. <laughs> Very nice. I know that's the one that everybody kind of critically craps on, but I don't care. I was happy I was there. I was 17. Okay. So, you know, forget it. <laughs> that is my <laughs> WrestleMania. <laughs> Forget y'all. That's your moment. Yeah. <laughs> well, WrestleMania 11 was my memorable, and it, that gets crapped on as the worst WrestleMania. So, you know. Oh, really? So, uh, so people crap on that one worse than they crap on 27. WrestleMania 11 I was guess. the worst. Wow. Me and okay. Jason went to that one. Mm-hmm. It felt like a, it felt like a house show, and it pretty much was. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And that was in Connecticut. I mean, the main. Yeah, it was a bad they say for the, first the main event, the main event was uh, Lawrence Taylor against Bam Bam Bigelow, yeah. and the winner at the end of the night wasn't even a wrestler. Wow, think yeah. about that. And Bam Bam was the star that night because he he deserved yeah. everything he got. I mean, it was just yeah. well, and of course Sean lost. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, what does the future hold for the both of you? Yeah, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I hope uh, I hope my my uh, cryptocurrency turns around. <laughs> um, it's really down right now, but anyway, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll see what the future holds. I mean, I thought after the. I thought after the um, uh, I thought after the uh, we did the DVD, the click DVD, and then the the raw segment. I thought that was it. I thought that was the end. You know, we we did our interview. That's it. Uh, time time to move on. It's it's uh, we already recognized. And then I got a call from a producer last year. Um, he contacted me um, wanted to do the interview for the the Shawn Michaels DVD and I talked to him for about an hour and we were he just he was not did not really know too much he was an old school wrestling guy but he wanted to know more about the curtain call and what happened and how how we got involved you know what was our involvement with the whole uh, recording and all that and I, and I explained to him and and it was like the height of COVID. It was like the the peak of COVID, and he was gonna come and interview me. He interviewed Manny because uh, he's up in up north, and unfortunately, due to COVID, it, we just weren't able to get together. Uh, so so Manny was able to to take take the torch. Oh, it's I don't know what the word the word is, but uh, still the spotlight. To, <laughs> still the spotlight. Yeah, and. Um, uh, so he did, he did a great job representing uh, the both of us and uh, interviewed for that. And then I don't know I don't know what else the, the future holds. I mean, if WWE calls us for some some special event or something, or or maybe they might have a you know a um, real um, what's the word like a type of uh, uh, I don't want to say Hall of Fame with. Uh, if they have like say that. memorabilia, memorabilia, you know, maybe we'll 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 have something there. But I don't know. They still have to have a they still have to have a building. I'm sure they'll have a wing of nostalgic stuff. You know, that's why they probably have this show. But um, we'll see. We'll 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 see what happens. Uh, I just wish all this happened like, you know, not twenty uh, something years later. I wish a lot of it happened sooner when we were we were um younger but you know what hey it, it ha- it's happening now because the times have changed you know and and that's that's great so count your blessings absolutely i agree with you 100 percent. and uh for me it's just as far as wrestling or wwe i mean i'll still keep doing these podcasts um at first i was against them i didn't really want to do them i, I told myself that there's no re- no need for me to actually do them. But I said, you know what? Let me do them. They're fun. 
and I told Jay I'm just gonna cancel all of them. But it <laughs> turned out the other way. Jay talked to me into it, and I said, you know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll do all. I'll do all of them that were booked for. And uh, probably in about, I don't know. I'm guessing five years there might be a physical WWE museum. So that's probably our next place that we'll wind up in for the tape, obviously. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Well, Manny and Jason, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, Pleasure. like, thank you guys so much. Like, I'm really honored to talk to you both. So if you can just tell people, you know, where to follow you and where to, you know, find you on social media and just anything that you've got going on and stuff, you, you may do sure. so now. Sure. I'm on Facebook, Manny Motadi, M-A-N-I-M-O-H-T-A-D-I. And then I'm also on Instagram as WWE Curtain Call Kid. That's all. And um, yeah, like I said, I just have a Facebook page with, you know, my my name. Uh, if anybody wants to feel free to reach out to me and message me, I'll be more than happy to uh, reply. And uh, that's really it. And yes, he's the real current golf kid, not me. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just the annoying guy. We're, we make a good tag team. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. You guys take care. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Bye. Take care. Okay, so I was sitting with my friends one day and they asked me, Stephanie, how do you record your podcast? And I said, with the Anchor app on my phone. And they were like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, it's that simple. It is absolutely free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and your computer. And it will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can also make money from the podcast with no minimum listenership. And it's got everything you need to make a podcast in one place. They even have classes and stuff that you can listen to that will give you all kinds of good tips on what you need to do in order to make the best podcast. So if you want to do this, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm or download the free Anchor app to get started. All right, so I want to thank Manny and Jason for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. They definitely did not have to do that, um, but I'm really happy that they chose to come on and talk to me on the 25th anniversary um, of them recording the curtain call moment between the click. They really didn't have to do that, but they did, and I'm really grateful for them for talking to me and showing me and telling us all the stories that they've told us, you know, on this episode. So, um... If you want to listen to the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, you can listen to me everywhere podcasts are available. That's iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and even on YouTube, where I have video versions of the interviews, some of the interviews that I've done, and really just the entire audio um, clips of the um, of the episodes there. And you can also follow me on Instagram at Hardy Wrestling Podcast and on Twitter at Hardy Wrestle Pod. Um, and be on the lookout for my newest episode that I'm going to release this weekend with Miss Jen from Miss Thickums TV on TikTok. So um, I hope you're being your best self and I hope you're being safe because there's still a pandemic going on. And I hope that, you know, in the midst of everything, you're still pushing through and just being the light of the world and not necessarily, you know, contributing to the darkness of the world because there's so much of that. So. Until next time, really until next weekend, this is the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl Stephanie Hardy. And until next time, bye y'all.